All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here today for Conversations on Collecting with Patrick Anderson and Dr. Dr. Zenon Trilowski. Uh, my name is Nathaniel Marchand. I am the Program Coordinator here at Griffin Art Projects, and I'm joined today by Jazz Lally from the Contemporary Art Society of Vancouver. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging that Griffin Art Projects is situated on the ancest ancestral, ancestral territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish, and Stolo Nations, and we are honored and grateful to undertake our work here. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Jazz, and I would like to acknowledge that we are honored to work on the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. This recognition is a gesture of respect towards the Indigenous stewards of the land we occupy, whose rich cultures are fundamental to artistic life in Vancouver and to our work at CSAB. As we gather online today, I want to take this opportunity to invite everyone here to share the lands they are joining us from, um, if you would like to. Thank you, Jazz. So I just have a few um, housekeeping notes before we get started today. Um, you will note that we do have live captioning available for today's webinar. So if you would like to see the live caption displayed, you can select the CC live transcription button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, I will note that it's not perfectly accurate. It does struggle with some um, proper names, um, but we, we hope that it'll be helpful in capturing most of what we're saying today. Also, if you're experiencing any technical difficulties with the Zoom interface, uh, we're also live streaming today's event on Griffin Art Projects Facebook page, which you can see the link there. Or if you just go on Facebook and type in Griffin Art Projects, it'll bring you there and it should be right at the top of our feed. So if you're having any trouble, you can just log on there as well. I'm just gonna unspotlight myself here. Okay. So um, I would like to also acknowledge that we are um, on Zoob's webinar format today. So that means that we can't see or hear you, but if you would like to get in touch, there is the chat dialogue box at the bottom of your screen. And I would also like to note that at the end of today's presentation or throughout really, if you would like to ask either Zenin or Patrick a question, you'll notice that there's also a Q&A box. So if you wouldn't mind uh, messaging us for the questions in that box, it makes them a little easier to navigate. Uh, or if you'd like to ask your question aloud, you can raise a little virtual hand that you'll also see along that toolbar. And that will kind of indicate to us that we can unmute you. Um, just be aware that we are recording today's presentation. Uh, we will be archiving it. Uh, so your audio will be captured in that recording if you so choose. So today's conversation on collecting between Patrick Anderson and Dr. Zenon Trilowski will highlight the history and evolution of the Trilowski collection and is presented in conjunction with Griffin Art Project's current exhibition, Teeth, Loan, and Trust Company Consolidated, the Trilowski Collection, which is on view at Griffin Art Project's until December 11th and was curated by Patrick Anderson. Building on one of Griffin Art Project's mandates to examine new currents in contemporary collecting practices, Conversational Collecting is an ongoing series that considers the methodologies, thematics, and narratives that shape collecting practices in Vancouver, Canada, and beyond. So I'll begin by presenting our, one of our guests today. Dr. Zena Trilowski was born in Edmonton, Alberta. He moved to Vancouver with his family after high school and attended UBC, where he received a degree in zoology and then studied dentistry. Long, in, long inter, interested in modern art, architecture, and music, Dr. Trilowski started a collaboration with his friend, Patrick Anderson, to have gallery events at his own dental office a collaboration which became the Trilowski Gallery. And our second guest today, Patrick Anderson, is Associate Professor in the Odane Faculty of Art at Emily Carr University of Art and Design, and a freelance art critic and curator. Anderson received a PhD in art history from the University of British Columbia with a dissertation on the post-war reception of Marcel Duchamp's work. He has curated exhibitions locally and internationally since the late 1980s and operates Trap Projects, an independent curatorial and publishing platform founded, founded in 1997. 
Great. So at this point, I'll, I'll invite Zenon and Patrick uh, to go ahead and join us as well. And we can get the conversation started. Can't I can't seem to uh, start the video? Okay, I'm Let's... locked out. Me too. <clears throat> Strange. You disabled it. There we are. There we go. go. Start my that. video. Here. It... There we are. Okay. <laughs> well, from East Vancouver and West Vancouver. Um, here we are. And thank you for the land acknowledgements. And uh, um, uh, and I want to acknowledge uh, um, all the people here as well uh, who have made this exhibition happen and and so forth. And particularly Lisa, um, the director of Baldessera, uh, Brittany Greutlers, um, of course, Jas and Nathaniel for all the work they're doing today here. And uh, uh, but also um, the incredible staff that helped hang this exhibition, which I think was uh, a little bit more challenging and large than uh, was first uh, imagined, I think, by Lisa and myself. So <laughs> they did a great job. Um, yeah, I don't know how uh, we want to do this. I, I think what maybe what I'll do is uh, I'm going to start by, um, well, actually, one more acknowledgement. I, I this, you know, um, the Griffin Art Projects is is uh, an incredible venue, and it's a real like luxury to be able to to work and privilege to work uh, with this institution, an institution uh, founded by um, two important collectors here in Vancouver, Brigitte and Henning Freiby. and um, there are a lot of, of course, you know, the focus of this gallery, as I understand it, is researching and supporting and. Uh, questioning, uh, collecting activities and so on. And uh, just wanna acknowledge uh, that one, one of our sort of uh, premier collectors passed away uh, two weeks ago, I think it was, uh, Andrew Gruft. And so I thought I'd just uh, put him out there. Now, uh, I don't know how to, how many people are here because I can't see. I don't know who has been to the exhibition. And with that in mind, I decided to pull out some uh, images from the show that I took with my cell phone. They're not the greatest. The, the show is being documented properly. But uh, before people start asking questions uh, to Dr. Zanon, you might want to remind yourself of what's in this collection and how this exhibition happened. So I'm going to give a little bit of a preamble. Uh, sorry, Zanon, uh, you don't have... Go ahead. You can jump in at any time. So I'm going to try to share my screen. Uh, here we go. And as Jazz pointed out in my bibliography, uh, I did my PhD uh, focusing on, amongst other things, Marcel Duchamp, a uh, French artist, who, uh, uh, as it happens to be... Um, and I was working on that in the 90s, uh, in the days when I met Dr. Zanin Tralowski. Uh, when he started his dental practice in 1996, um, both of us were already uh, quite familiar with the Vancouver art scene and international art as such. Um, and so, you know, an opportunity sort of arose in my head for, and I think for, for Zanin, uh, to sort of somehow be involved in all this, me as a curator, I suppose, and Zenon, I don't think he realized at the time as a collector, but certainly as someone supporting uh, contemporary art. And I'm showing you this uh, check signed by Marcel Duchamp in 1919 for $115 uh, after he couldn't afford a dental check. Um, with his, or a dental, a dental payment to his doctor, Daniel Zank. And I was joking in those days that with Zenon that, uh, you know, this, there's, a, there's a long legacy of uh, artists working with dentists, not only working on their teeth. Um, 
Dr. Daniel Zank also had the convenient last name of Zank, which I thought was a funny pun at the time. Not only does it say thank, it misreads as thank you or Dr. Thank, um, but the T and the Z reminded me of Zenon Tralowski. So I think it, I, if I remember right, I, I sort of somehow this check was in my head and I don't know. And uh, I don't know how many people know this, but Marcel Duchamp, uh, he supposedly quit making art in 1923 uh, to devote his life to things like chess, curating and other things. But secretly, um, he lived in Greenwich. He moved from Paris to, to New York and he, he lived in Greenwich Village and he, he had a secret uh, apartment across the hall from um, Tini and his apartment or where they lived, where he was working on a, an artwork, which would become his last artwork, which um, is now is called Eton Donné. Um, and um, it's now in the collection of the Museum of Art in Philadelphia. Um, but I thought, so when Zenon took over this dental practice, I noticed that he had a private office across the hall that clients didn't seem to know about. And I thought, oh, this is kind of like Marcel Duchamp or something, having a little place where he could do things not in public and such. And so we started talking and, and Zenon will probably correct me if I'm making up stories here, but in my mind, uh, we had this idea, we, we planted this idea of doing exhibitions in that side room. I was joking at the time that, I mean, I was basically just trying to get a space to curate. Uh, so I think I was, you know, just hungry for places to do that. And I didn't really have the experience to do those things. And uh, I think Zenon at the time was very interested in having people know about his practice. So having art openings in the back across the hall and making his dental office a bar was a very convenient way to, I don't want to say trap people, but you know, like bring people <laughs> into, into, our, into seeing things that, you know, I was certainly interested in at the time, which was a lot of emerging artists artists who wasn't, weren't getting shows at the time. So that's kind of how our relationship sort of began in terms of, of art curating. And I think it probably started earlier in some form or another, but um, so I show you this. This is another Marcel Duchamp. I'm not gonna bore you with Marcel Duchamp, but, uh, but at some point in the fifties, he published a, a book of notes, a facsimile of all his notes re, re, uh, referring to the large glass, his last work that he made, which supposedly would explain what the work was about. And as people found out, there isn't a simple, simple reading of the work. In fact, the notes can be mixed up in any order and new meanings can constantly be produced. And I found myself uh, curating this exhibition going through Zenon's collection I could have done this exhibition, organized this exhibition in many different ways. So um, the way it looks right now, I can imagine it being a very different show another time. It's just about how you organize those notes. And I hope Zanon doesn't mind, but I brought some pictures from his office. Again, they're just cell phone photographs. I showed them last week. I'll go through them very quickly, but just to give a sense of where, how on a normal daily basis, how some of this art in this exhibition, you know, exists, uh, especially in this office. So this is the work by Adad Hanna on the left, a video work, a film work that, that behaves like a photograph. And um, as you're sitting in a waiting room, uh, it becomes quite contemplative. And after a while you realize he's actually moving and so on. And then a work by Graham Gilmer on the right, I barely touched you which uh, seems to respond to uh, the relationship uh, of the dentist and the client in some kind of humorous way. This is a permanent piece by Eric Metcalf. This work was already in the office when Zanon took over the practice from Dr. Doug Foster. And I think that was one of the, wasn't just, you know, him and I who were interested in art, but the previous doctor as well. 
And yes, I'm just going to shoot through some slides. And of course, this collect this these offices change with time. Different art kind of comes and goes. But just a few snaps. Sorry, I should I, I should say that's Kim Kennedy Austin. That's a knockoff work by Ron Tarada, knockoff on Cora. Kim Kennedy Austin on the right, Eric Metcalf on the left, Vicky Alexander on the right. Um, Laughing Gas by Neil Wedman on the left. And actually, this uh, the Neil Wedman is the first work one sees when one enters the exhibition. Is this useful? Should I stop or should I go through a couple of images from the show? Is that fine? Nathaniel or Jazz? Yeah, I don't yeah, absolutely. Context is great. Let's see it. <laughs> Just a little context. Then people can ask questions about all this to Zenon. I figure he gets all the difficult questions. I'll just kind of, you know, cruise through this. Um, after all, he's a doctor. I put, but, well, there's two doctors here. And I thought that was kind of funny in this context because I'm a doctor and he's a doctor. We're different kinds of doctors. And the work on the right there is by Rodney Graham from the early 90s. A work, I believe, and Zenon might correct me, he would have purchased as a, as a support. It was a fundraiser for the Orr Gallery back in those days. And, um, but it's, you have doc, Dr. Freud and, and you have Baudelaire on the right. Both of them are um, hunted down by Rodney Graham uh, 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 in a way, like looked at so closely that there, there is a kind of a moment when the two seem to be talking to each other the two writers, one from a medical discipline and one from a uh, more poetic and artistic discipline. So I, maybe this is a portrait of Zenon and me, I don't know. Uh, left is a molar, I would say. <laughs> Zenon would tell me what it is. Uh, it's a text drawing by Kim Kennedy Austin where she has repetitively uh, repeated lines from uh, Margaret Atwood's Blind Assassin. So it's actually, if you look at it closely, you can read that tooth, which look, also looks like an island. And then in the foreground, you have a work by um, Alex Tedley Stuchberg called Egg, I believe. But in my mind, it looks like a tooth or a head, maybe a head that Dr. Freud is looking at and trying to analyze. It's actually made by um, uh, casting a piece of styrofoam that has washed up on the west coast on one of the islands. It's been cast into bronze and it now functions also as a, uh, normally you would put a incense burner in it, which on it from a curatorial level I thought was nice next to uh, the cigar of Sigmund Freud. So across from that, you have a wide variety of work. So I'm not going to go into details. I can always come back to things. But, you know, how do you organize all this stuff? I really didn't know all the stuff that Zenon had until we started digging around. And, um, and then made a selection of works, trying to kind of grab a, like as wide a variety of work as possible, because it's not one particular type of work. Maybe Zenon can say more about his uh, ec eclectic collection, if there is some unity to it. But in the middle of this, uh, this little scenario here, we have a work by the LA artist, David Cordy, that I put in the center, uh, because of course it's a mouth. The teeth are made up of letters, of alphabets uh, kind of. And uh, so we tried to kind of design the composition of this room, uh, Lisa and I, based on that image in the middle. So actually make a smile out of the composition. Uh, so anyway, I'm gonna go through faster. I'm just gonna kind of walk through. As you can see, if I was to talk about all the work, I'm, I'm, I so easily do that. So I'll try to avoid by just shooting through slides. Um, whoops. The work by Tony Romano on the left, a film that's, the, the beginning of the film is shown on one side, the end on the other side. It's a soundtrack by Tyler Breath. Kelly Wood in the background. I mean, a lot of different artists here coming together who 
some of them wouldn't normally show together. Some of them have shown together. Tom Burroughs on the left, Robert Klein in the yellow there, uh, Vicky Alexander, Karen Bubash, Kelly Wood. And on the floor is a work by Ryan Quast, a painting by Ryan Quast. Rodney Graham on the right and on the top in the, in, on the ceiling is a word called, work called Portal by Neil Campbell. Uh, Attila Richard Lucas on the left, Rodney Graham on the right, the two works on the right. Cameron Kerr, Eric Metcalf, sort of organic and geometric abstraction. Graham Gilmore, uh, Derek Root, and Isabel Powells. Parvin Pevandi, David Cordy, Eric Metcalf, uh, Tom Burroughs. That's Pivandi. Who has a show on at the Broad Art Foundation. I think it just finished yesterday, actually, so I shouldn't advertise that. <laughs> uh, Kelly Lycan, Al McWilliams. And then we had, so just very briefly, uh, so this is kind of, uh, we have a kind of an archive. We made an archive in the back because it was kind of left over from the previous Kentridge show, The Black Room. So we decided to use that and just put little sort of fragments of work from exhibitions that took place at what we, what Zenon called the Trilowski Gallery, uh, a place where I curated for about 10 years, um, on and off. And so we have work here by Ron Tarada, Mavonwe McLeod, uh, Jerry Allen, Shannon Oxenen, Lo uh, Lotta Antonsson, uh, on the far left is work by Holly Ward, Marcel Duchamp up at the top, uh, and then work by uh, Claire Greenshaw and Arnie Haraldson, and a work on the far, far, far left, two little postcards. It's actually one postcard, two sides of it by Ron Tarada. So 1997, this was our first show. I managed to find a, an invite from it. We tried to make it look... Uh, uh, you know, I didn't know anything about design, but, you know, we try to make it look kind of official. It's a block away from the Vancouver Art Gallery, so we had, you know, big competition. This was the first show. And so we kept some of the furniture from his side office uh, to make it more kind of, you know, it had a drop ceiling and all kinds of things. But this is Mavoma McLeod and Shannon Oxen. And I, uh, don't think they knew each other until we did this exhibition and they've worked a lot since and uh, they're both still making art important art and, and so on so this is very early you know uh, they may at that time it may it may not mean anything now but I, I would say in 1997 to propose to Canada Council that you want to do a drawing show or something like that and something focusing on what they were focusing on would have been very difficult most of the attention was on photo conceptual art, uh, certainly not painting and kind of uh, cartoony drawings. It's kind of pop, almost pop, pop art. I was call it almost like pop conceptualism. But of course, shortly thereafter, a couple of years, like around this time, actually, it was around this time, um, Belkin Art Gallery would do a show with them. Yvonne was in, Shannon wrote in and so on. Lotta Antonsson. I don't have any images from this show to show you. There's some in the in the exhibition. Uh, she came from Sweden to do the show. So this is just stuff, you know, like me digging around. Villa Malaparte by Arnie Haraldson. We did a show uh, which was focused on Godard, uh, Malaparte, and an architectural firm in Italy who all had big egos, and their egos clashed at a particular moment. This is, what, this is what the show would look like. And, you know, I think back to these shows. Now they look almost like, first of all, my documentation sucked, sucked. And, you know, I wish I had better documentation and all that stuff. And, of course, uh, uh, it's a very humble space and so on. But, but I remember, you know, getting uh, phone calls from, 
because it was by appointment how you would see these shows and you know uh you know all the local curators and so on would come to these exhibitions on their lunch breaks and so on and uh I remember even Aquium Visor, who just passed away very recently, um, who was at the time working on Documenta. He, he came by to see this exhibition. And so it was kind of a, a kind of liberating experience to know that you don't have to have a big, fancy, expensive space uh, to have people pay attention. This is uh, Ian Sked, four units, four. Uh, four proposals for living units, it's called. Holly Ward. The phone, this was the kind of the invite image. Uh, you know, because you had to make an appointment. You had to phone the dentist. I mean, while you're doing it, while you're going to see the show, you might as well get a cleaning, right? Um, this was, I believe, her first show, actually, Holly Ward. I could be wrong if she's here listening. It was one, oh, not first show, but first kind of like public kind of show. Um, so it was exciting and, and uh, it's called the new colony. She's still living on that colony as far as I'm, I know. I'm shooting through faster because I'm realizing people are probably bored by now. Uh, Clement, uh, um, Claire Greenshaw, but this is what openings could look like. At this point, you can see this is the same office, but the owners of the building decided to get rid of the drop ceiling, get rid of the carpet and look what was underneath, right? Pretty incredible space. Um, that was a show I did with Tony Romano and Marcel Duchamp. And I thought I'd stop with this image, maybe just to say, you know, uh, these are two works that are in the exhibition. I, sorry, Zenon, I should ask for permission before I show your home. But the wood paneling behind you is the same as here. Normally, a lot of this art hangs in, in your home. Yeah. And uh, I love this image that I just took as a quick snap as a reference uh, because it also has your daughter's, or is it your son? I think it's your daughter's son. uh, no, gumball son. machine. Your son's gumball My machine. My son's gumball machine from school. From school. So, you know, art and life. Woodworking yeah. project. <laughs> so I thought I'd maybe uh, stop the share. <laughs> That's enough stuff. <laughs> Maybe maybe Nathaniel can start with a question or something. I don't know where to go from here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we actually already got one in the Q&A. Uh, so I do encourage anybody in the audience, if they have a question for either Patrick or Zenon to uh, drop one in there. So this one comes from Jane Irwin. Uh, they say, fascinating exhibition. Thank you. Are all the artists from Vancouver and are they all patients of yours, Zenon? No, um, they're not. They're, most of them are from definitely BC but not all of them are patients. Some are, I'd say the majority are patients or were patients at some point, but there's, you know, work that are, you know, that I bought in different places through regular channels. So on that note, I'm wondering if maybe you could just get into uh, a little more detail about, about how, how kind of that, um, that exchange with, with some of these artists and, and, for dental services in exchange for art and how that came to be. And when you started that, if, if you, you kind of saw that as something that you were gonna continue doing throughout your practice. Well, when I took over the practice from uh, Dr. Doug Foster uh, back in 96, so a while ago, he was already, he, I was really impressed with his collection in, in the office. And, um, you know, he had works by Ian Wallace and Mark Lewis, uh, Jeff Wall, all kinds of interesting work, Ken Lum, all kinds of, you know, the art was already on the wall. And of course, that installation that still exists by Eric Metcalf, the, the sort of leopard print. And, you know, we maintained that, kept that in the office since, you know, since I took it over and it was done much earlier. So he had planted that seed in my brain about continuing um, working with uh, a lot, you know, working with, with patients that are artists and, um, and can, you know, starting a, a collection that way. Now, I know that you collect art in all sorts of ways, as you, as you alluded to, you, you also purchase art. Um, I'm curious, as you've been building your collection, is there a particular 
approach that you take, uh, a genre of art? Um, do you focus on emerging artists, established artists? Is there anything that you focus on? Not particularly. You know, it's art that um, that I like. You know, things that I have to look at, and and also work that um, is stimulating in in one way or another. But of course, it can't. It has to fit in with a an office that has all kinds of people coming through it and sitting in a waiting room and looking at things. So things have to be tasteful, not too shocking. You know, that kind of thing as well is important. Right. But I'm, I don't really have a particular, you know. I'm not following any kind of a pattern as far as what I'm collecting. You know, it's a broad range of work, but interesting. And then there was a lot of, oh, when Patrick was going through the slides, there were some references to like teeth and mouth and molars. Um, when there, an exchange happens, is sometimes an artist make a work particularly themed on, on the dentist yeah. Kind of idea? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah definitely. Definitely. And, and how does that like differ when, for example, when you have a patient, a new client come in, for example, what is their reaction to the space? Because it is so different from like the typical um, austere dentist office that we're all so used to going to. Um, that atmosphere that you've created with the original artwork in the space. Can you speak about the earlier reactions of um, first clients, and then also as you've built up patients as well, and through the years, how are they enjoying the work as well? I think most people enjoy it and certainly find it a, you know, refreshing or different, you know, they enjoy that side of things. Sometimes in, you know, ex you know we have to explain the work uh, to people that really, you know, that don't understand it particularly or why it's the way it is. And that's, uh, yeah, it's always a conversation starter. Do um, your staff sometimes get to pick a work or place a work where they would like to like see all the time during their day in uh, the office? They have a little input, yeah, <laughs> not that much. But, you know, of course, you know, they, they, they have favorites or they may think that something is not their favorite so that, you know, and I'll, I'll make, a, make changes when necessary. It's quite reflective. We things, we try to change it once in a while, you know, just to keep things, fresh uh, but um a few solid pieces have been on the wall for a long time actually i'm curious a little bit as well about about both but it's kind of a question for both of you in a way it's a it's kind of a, an alternative space obviously to be showing art i know lots of dentist office and doctor's office have art on the wall but it's not necessarily from their personal collections not necessarily focused on contemporary art um, so I'm curious, were there any challenges in, in both showing art there, hosting shows there, or curating in that space? Zenon, was I a pain in the ass curating? No, shows? Not, not at all. I mean, that we haven't done one of those shows for a long time. But when I had um, more room, more space in my actual so-called private office across the hall, which didn't, you know, wasn't used for any sort of treatment at all, but it was a place for paperwork and a break, uh, we would, you know, take the furniture or, or extraneous things out of there, clear it out. And then, so the shows were really only available on a weekend, you know, otherwise I'd have to put everything back in. So they're kind of more of a, those shows could be anything. And it was just sort of more of a event. It was just a fun thing to have, not just for the art, but there was like an opening and lots of people. And, you know, it was, it was, it was a, Good experience. I should I should also add for me as a curator, um, you know, it was really, and still to this day, kind of I, I find these sort of things important as much as I really appreciate the Griffin paying me to curate a show. I mean, let's be, you know, and putting money into this and organize like all of you doing this work. There's something also liberating when you don't have any of that support. And I think Zenon Space was enough of this, but it was a platform, it was a place. And I think every show that we did, as far as I'm concerned, was more or less zero budget. Like we did spend money on like printing an invite. Or in one case, we flew an artist from Los Angeles. It was 200 bucks, I think. We got a good deal, uh, <laughs> you know. But the thing is, you know, you work with you work with what you have, and 
and sometimes just having a, a space, especially in a place like Vancouver, is huge. And so for me, I was very grateful for Zen and offering to kind of um, clear, you know, for like a month or however long the show was, sort of clear his office for that and also his staff for taking phone calls from people who want to come and see an exhibition rather than get a root canal you know yeah. uh, but i think to to this day i mean the show i have in my gallery right now i mean the premise i said to the artists i was working with unfortunately i said you know we can do anything you want but i have zero money and so you know uh i think it's like about of course and i'm lucky to have a space to work in and so, you know, I, I, I use, I often use it in teaching, like I use the example of, of Zenon as an example of like, of his space as something which, you know, it has to do with relationships. It has to do with an ecology of people and things and objects and economies and so on. And you have to adapt. And Zenon's space was very open to adapting to various things within, of course, like, you know, I mean, there was never any arguments about things. It was kind of more mutual interests, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I trust uh, I trust Patrick's, uh, you know, sense uh, of being a curator, you know, in his opinion, is really uh, appreciated differently. But I have a question for Zanon. Can I ask a question? Sure. <laughs> what are you doing later? No, that's not the question. Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, so you know, we put this stuff up and I remember like once we were loading the truck with all this art and stuff, you look quite surprised yourself. I don't think yeah. you realized <laughs> how much uh, art there was. And we actually edited your collection. So not everything's in it, in the exhibition. Uh, but, and you, as someone asked, um, I think Nathaniel asked about whether it was like, a, there is like a, a particular thing you're looking for in a collection and you, you described it as not being preconceived, but looking back at it now, as I've hung the show, do you see some patterns or do you see, is there some pattern to the whole thing? I don't know. <laughs> what do you think? Or what, yeah. what holds it together maybe? Or I think, I think a lot of it is, um, uh, it seems like I, I, I'm a lot of it is photo based that I like, and and certainly the paintings are you know more um, you know abstract, conceptual or conceptual, yeah. um, not too much figurative work. And I, I imagine I would like some more, but I just don't have any right now. I think there's maybe two or three faces or people in it really when I think of it. And I'd probably need more of that. But, you know, the whole, it was just a, when they, Patrick and the Griffin um, asked me to put this together, asked Patrick to put it together and me to provide the art, you know, it, it, and then when everything, like Patrick said, everything was packed up and put in the van and we took all the work down from my walls at home and in the office and things that I had stored for years that I unwrapped and discovered that I forgot about practically that hadn't had a chance to be on the wall for a long time. I, you know, really made me realize that, yes, I, I guess I really am a collector. I never really thought of myself that way before. So it was a real, you know, and seeing it all up in, in the space is a, um, was a real privilege. And, but as far as, uh, and, you know, I think there is some similarity in, in it. Like, like Patrick said, that kind of, um, ties certain things together, but certainly a lot of it has to do with how Patrick and the staff organized it and Lisa and, and the, you know, put it up on the walls, how it was really curated. And, you know, and Patrick, I remember it was, I hadn't heard you say it before, but the way you talked about it, it was like DJing, laying all the work down on the floor, moving it around, you know, and, and getting ideas of what goes, how together, you know, it's real, it's, that's an art form in itself. I, I Maybe a better metaphor is like cooking in someone else's kitchen. Yeah. 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 We do have a few questions in the Q&A here. This one's from Stephen Wilson. 
Is the work in your collection that you would not hang at the office? Is, is your approach to exhibiting the work the same at the office as it would be at home? Uh, probably, probably the same, yeah. Are there any works? Sorry, go ahead. I don't know, I don't really have any works that would be, um, you know, what I would consider or what someone might consider inappropriate. I don't think I really have anything like that anyway, so it wouldn't really make a difference. But, you know, it's just hearing certain, like, for example, the, the Capture Festival that had the works by um, uh, Stephen Shearer, who's actually a patient of mine, too, on the, on the path, on the, on the bicycle path in our Beauty's Corridor. And then it, I think it lasted maybe a week or less before they were forced to take them down just because some people complained about the work, thinking they, you know, they were basically photographs of people sleeping, but people were concerned that it was people that were dead, you know. So I imagine I could have a piece like that and I would just explain it every single time if someone had a question about it. We have another you know, one here from Zuzi Gartner. Uh, there are a lot of pieces, as Patrick pointed out. Is it all on display at the, dent at the dental office and the space across the way or is it stored and do they circulate back and forth? Um, I think yeah, it's th certain things are stored, certain things are keeping my private office. Yeah, and, and I try to circulate as much as possible. And then a lot of things I just have hidden away. Uh, I don't want to give it away, but Zevin does not live in an endlessly large mansion, nor is his office endlessly, you know, exactly. full of space. Yeah. So it is a kind of a limited. <clears throat> But that, you know, what's interesting, I think now is that I think you, now you can look back at your collection and you could probably think, oh, maybe it's time to like rethink what I put up and, you know, it, it becomes, uh, and so it's, it must be a valuable kind of uh, archive now to have even like images from the show. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it certainly is. Cause and that's so true, you know, because both my office and my home have uh, windows. We all, everybody likes a view in Vancouver of anything or at least get some light in. So that leaves uh, precious little wall space. Uh, so that is, you know, that's why I, I need to keep them rotated. I, I want to just share like two two moments that are personal because the way Zenon collects is, I don't even know how you really collect stuff and what there are some trades involved and so on, but I can give you two moments that were important, I think. For uh, that I recall, kind of important in terms of alternative ecolo ecologies, and that and that reference to the Duchamp check of Duchamp not being able to afford his dental bill. But I remember I organized an exhibition with two artists, Tony Romano and Tyler Brett, who are included in this exhibition, and uh, it was their first exhibition. They had just graduated from Emily Carr, and we did an exhibition. It was a kind of post-apocalyptic exhibition, and. Uh, but they, uh, but Tyler was, uh, he always seemed very nervous and uh, he didn't show up sometimes to meetings. And, and I finally said to Tony, like, what's going on with Tyler? He's so quiet. He doesn't, you know, he, he seems like he doesn't want to do this. And he said, well, I think he's got an impacted tooth. And I said, well, why doesn't he deal? He has to deal with it. And he goes, he can't afford it you know, and I remember going, oh my God. Uh, so A, I'm very selfish. I want my show to open. <laughs> and B, I care about Tyler. And uh, in this case, uh, you know, and that's how, like I started making editions with artists and the first edition I ever made was, came out of a, a toothache. And, uh, uh, and so we, we ran up to fu Future Shop because it, it was a post-apocalyptic exhibition about the future. Um, and so we went up to Future Shop and we printed out eight images um, that uh, we took over to Zenon. And I think if I remember right, it was like, they weren't cheap to print. I think they were like four bucks each. I think I actually paid the money because Tyler didn't even have the money for that. but. 
we traded those for uh, whatever you did to them. I don't know, root canal impact. I don't know what it was, but and the show went on. Yeah. <laughs> so that was one moment that I think was kind of like characteristically like, you know, and then the other time and and the other time was uh, I, I mean, many moments like this, but I remember David Cordy, uh, an artist from Los Angeles, like very well established shows, you know, he came up and taught a class with me at Emily Carr. And I couldn't understand why he would want to teach a class up at Emily Carr with me. And, uh, 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 and I said, why are you really here? And he said, well, I, I'm actually here because I want to I want to spend the, the false fishing. I want to come up fishing. Well, in the middle of the teaching year, he got a really sore yeah. tooth. And then he was going to go back to L.A. because he he couldn't handle it. He didn't have the insurance in Canada to deal with the tooth. And and uh, and in doing this exhibition um, with Zenon, I discovered there were three David Cordy's in the collection. Uh, and which was the reason why he stayed and kept teaching. <laughs> and he was actually very influential on a lot of artists while he was here teaching. So I, I keep thinking, well, what if he wouldn't have fixed his tooth, you know? Um, so, so his smile is in the center of that one wall, that big smile. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. That's a great moment to share, Patrick. Thank you. <laughs> then it's all about building relationships, is it, right? With your clients, with the artists and seeing, and do you often follow the careers of the artists, the earlier artists that, you, that are part of your collection? Yeah, yes, I do. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, that, that is an important part of the whole, I mean, even with all my patients, I try to, you know, it's not just about the, their uh, dental health, it's b building relationships with people. And uh, so with the artists, uh, it's the same thing. Yeah, I, I do definitely try to follow them. Um, oh, yeah, but it's so important, isn't it? And um, there's a question in the chat, which um, it, it'd be really interesting to hear your perspective. As you said earlier, um, that you've got so much work and you're moving it off site or you're reorganizing it. Has there ever been a moment that you've had to like either sell or gift an art piece from the collection to maybe make space or you just found an opportunity to donate it? Not yet. I, I'm, you know, a lot of the work, um, it, certainly at home, you know, my family is used to it. They like it too. Um, so I haven't got to that stage yet, you know, but certainly seeing it now, all how much I really have, you, you start thinking about what you're going to do with it later on. Um, but at this stage, no, I, I sort of, you know, you don't want to give them up yet. But that's for sure. There's a really interesting question here as well. And something that I've actually kind of thought about before, uh, not only with um, teeth, but with bones as well. So uh, Julie Papajohn asks, dentistry is changed incredibly over the years. Digital imaging of teeth is fascinating now. Every time I look at the images of my teeth, I think artists should work with this imagery. Have you ever approached artists, maybe artists in your collection, to work with these digital images of teeth? No, I haven't, but I've actually thought that maybe I should do it myself. Um, you know, try to do something myself for a change instead of just uh, buying art. But there was a piece that I, I really, I remember seeing a piece by an artist, um, uh, I can't remember where she's from, but she actually projected an image of uh, an old movie onto her central incisor. And so she would keep her teeth open, smiling. And then I'm not sure, I think it was, it almost looked like it was backlit somehow, but that's impossible. So, but it was, uh, you know, definitely, you know, teeth and art somehow sometimes work to be pretty interesting. Have any of the artists requested like their x-rays or anything or dental molds to work on a project that they are working on or collaborate with you? No, actually not really. No, I can't oh. think of it. Might be something I, there. Yeah. But if it's, if it, I mean, too, you know, too many teeth and in, in, in the art, it's, it gets a bit cliche. Like it's just, you try to avoid that, you know, unless it's like a specific, um, somebody's specific experience um but otherwise yeah 
I, I yeah, I don't think anybody's really asked for that yet. So not only is there the exhibition currently at Griffin, but you just kind of wrapped up an exhibition called Office Works. Um, and as you mentioned, there's been several shows over the years uh, at the Trilowski Gallery. I'm curious if you have any uh, plans or, or kind of aspirations as to how you might want to feature your collection moving forward in the future. Um, well, unless, unless I, Patrick has another idea for another art exhibit in the office, I'll have to hang the, the other art back up on the wall in my space. But, you know, it's, that's, it, it, the problem is it's not a gallery, you know, so it's, uh, you know, I work in the office with patients and um, staff and you can't really just have a, it can't be open to the public, to the general public as easily as a, as a, a you know, a specific space that's dedicated to that. I can I can I can quickly share a couple of images if, if that's okay, Zanon, from the office yep. now. Mm -hmm. If I can, uh, if that. Yeah. Uh, the, so agree. so the problem I I didn't realize it initially, but I realized by taking all the art out of the office for two months, uh, it would be a pretty kind of sterile environment while the art was gone. And so I uh, Zanon and I discussed the idea of maybe doing something like almost like a reunion exhibition mm -hmm. <laughs> or something yeah. you know and so let's see here um oh i have to i have to find the oh this is where i i lose uh uh i think i can do share oh yeah do we see that are we back in zenon's home yes, yes. yes. okay okay so uh so right now there's, and these are really terrible photographs that I took with my cell phone, so I apologize, but um, uh, I found it, so, and it, I hope this doesn't come across the wrong way, but you know, when, when for anyone, but uh, when I, most people, when, when, when they go to the dentist, they don't, they don't think of it as like a laugh maybe laughing gas but not a laugh right like so uh we had of course removed this painting by neil wedman we, that spells out laughing gas and you know it's it's a work that i think makes people smile once they realize what it says and so on and and then i was just thinking about like who to invite in to do an exhibition during this time and i thought of three people uh who have really good laughs uh, so three local artists uh, who <laughs> enjoy their laughter, and one is Kim Kennedy Austin, and this is a, a work of hers, and the other artists are uh, Neil Wedman and uh, Ryan Quast. And they all know each other, they seem to kind of socialize, but not show together as such. So anyway, I basically said to them, like, uh, are you interested in being in a show? at the you know at this time i have no money there's nothing you know once again it's a typical my project where nothing is offered but they are extremely generous artists and um they made work specifically for this occasion and i said what's the title of the show office work i mean it's it was as open wide open as i could imagine and so kim made a series of silver point drawings uh, she describes the process of making these silver point drawings as in making the sound of scratching on teeth, like when someone's taking plaque off your teeth. She says it's a very, very similar activity of making these drawings. And they're done with silver. Uh, they're all done from uh, illustrations, like late 1800, early 20th century illustrations, uh, physiognomy books and journals and things like that and they all have smiles or something to do with teeth and she made them specifically for these frames uh, these frames were gifted from ilana aloni uh, it, they were made by her later us husband uh, 
um, Enerisalu. And so it was a kind of, uh, you know, responding, you know, to the situation. And then these are collages, quite large. You can't see it here, but they're quite large collages by Ryan Quast. We were joking and saying that most dental offices have landscapes, like cheesy landscape, Tony only kind of things at best. Uh, and so he made the, and they're sort of loosely based on video game uh, backgrounds, like early video game backgrounds. And then Neil Wedman uh, provided us with six watercolors um, that he calls complaint departments. They're kind of empty architectural places. You know, when you complain about something, there's never anyone there. They seem sort of almost like, yeah. Anyway, so they're, and they're distributed these works throughout the offices while this show is going on. Zenon, have you put anything on the ceiling yet? Or Patrick, have you ever considered putting anything on the ceiling? Well, well yeah, there? it's an I interesting, have... yeah. Well, Zenon, you may recall that we had this idea, which we never, maybe it's time to do it, but Zenon has a number of video works in the collection. And, you know, when you lie, like when you go to a dentist quite often, you, um, uh, you know, you're asked to, uh, um, look up and they sometimes put a TV in the ceiling and it's no different at Zenon's office. There are TVs there to distract you. Or, and so I, I used to joke that I wanted to design a menu. Like you go to a restaurant, like a menu and then you can pick your video art while you're having your work done on you. Whether it's a Tim Lee or Tony Romano or whatever, you know? And uh, so that's kind of a ceiling kind of concept. <laughs> yeah, there's also a question in the chat that kind of goes with this as well about um, creating a digital art exhibition in the dentist's office if you can obtain user rights to the exhibition so, or to the work. So that might be Oops. a different Sorry, way of yeah. viewing the work as well. That's true. Endless possibilities. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there is another question in the chat here. Uh, the transaction is an exchange of goods, material, artwork for service and dental work, but there's a sense of generosity here. How does the idea of generosity play into the exchange of the collection and the curation? Or do you feel that way? Yeah. Who are you at? Is Ellen, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, no, definitely. There is a sense of um, giving, giving to a, a, a certain community or, or at least certain people where I have a chance, the people that can't uh, afford it and um, helping people out. I mean, we try to do that sometimes. You know, I think all dentists one point or another uh, give their services away uh, to help people in need. That's part of, um, part of the, you know, part of the healing profession, really. You know, you, there's a empathy for people in need sometimes for sure yeah does that answer your question i i, sh I should add that the generosity uh for for zenon and me yeah. if we were to, if i can speak for both of us has also been in the artists all these artists willing to like when we do exhibitions willing to do that i mean they're you know yeah. it's generosity like the artists are being generous all these artists are, are generously you know uh, all right. yeah so I, I i feel like you know i feel privileged as well you know i do see that somebody has raised a virtual hand um jordan strom maybe i'll just unmute you jordan if you'd like to ask your question aloud i'll i'll you should be able to speak at this point I, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Sorry, I couldn't type this up. Um, so I guess my question relates more to um, less about the collection, though I'm really fascinated and really enjoyed the exhibition. It's more about um, these kind of ancillary sort of parasitic spaces. Um, and, you know, I think of the parallels in, in this city to spaces like Pulp Fiction and, and CSA. Um, and um, 
uh, well, just a few that came to mind were like Lucky's Comics and a, and a sort of parallel gallery space there. Um, data, a, a database and the Xeno Gallery where I was involved for a little while. Um, Massey Books, I guess more recently and, and their exhibition space. And um, even all these galleries that are in garages attached to homes. Um, and so yeah, these kind of parallel galleries are, um, or alternative spaces are so important to cities uh, like ours. I guess I, my question is, is if you had the option, would you, um, if you had more space, if, if you could create a white cube, high ceilinged professional gallery space with, with all the um, a trim, trimmings, would you, uh, would you uh, continue or would you go back and, and curate in that space or would you keep this kind of very um, early century uh, office type of, of um, space that you were able to occupy uh, as is. Who's the question for? Me or Both. is that? Both. Well, we're not really like a team, you know, we, uh, <laughs> 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 we, uh, we, we, we collaborate on occasion. I don't know, Zanon, you, I mean, I'm sure you wouldn't mind having a no, I wouldn't. I would not at all. You know, <laughs> I, I, I uh, but, could, but but I could work. But the it's ball. but yeah. But but Jordan, your 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 point. It's I'm really glad you raised that. There are a lot of like this is one example of, uh, you know, especially in a city that's so unaffordable to have those kind of spaces. Uh, and uh, while we have some support, it's you know it's difficult and. But somehow, consistently, I mean, to me, some of the most interesting spaces are these kind of things that kind of emerge. Like you, you forgot to mention an antisocial, you know, their little gallery in the closet in the back. I mean, I, just, I go to all these things and, you know, but there is a trajectory. And I think there's like, I think we need, we need, all, we need all of them. We need the institutional support on a larger level. We need private support, private collectors and so on. And, and we, but at the same time, it's like, you know, uh, things tend to grow, uh, yeah, under difficult conditions. It's not something I want to encourage, but, you know, but interesting things happen when it has to happen. I mean, you know, um, I don't know. It's like, I find it very optimistic that all these spaces emerge, but at the same time, the reasons why they emerge is because, you know, the conditions are tough, you know. Uh, there are not enough spaces for people to show and we have a lot of talented artists and um, but I don't think any I mean when the Griffin asked me to curate in their nice gallery I said yes of course uh, but I think I could probably make as interesting an exhibition in a dental office or in a shoe box but I mean it's a question of audience the kind of audience you want as well um, the outreach is different in, in those different situations. Yeah. That didn't really answer anything, but yeah. Thank you. We have um, another question in the chat from Alex Phillips. Um, and then it's about um, the responsibility and relationships as well. A lot of collectors become part of art history because they're part of the story of the work's providence. Do you have a sense of responsibility to the preservation of these works and to the collection that you're building? I've never thought of it that way, but that's, uh, that, uh, that's a good thought, definitely. Yeah, and that's probably one of the reasons why I, I don't really feel like getting rid of things at this stage or either selling them or uh, um, donating them at this stage you know I, it's there's memories attached to everything as well you know and so I but that's 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 a good point but, but there is you have taken care and this this exhibition kind of was uh, uh, and I'm very thankful that you actually uh, I mean you put a lot of effort into restoring a number of works, like some of the work that's on show right now, because of its stage and because of its medium, you know, photographs that fade and things like that. There was a lot of reprinting and reframing that had to be done. Mm -hmm. and so that's a kind of care. That's a yeah. responsibility. Yeah. yeah.
Well, we have one last very brief uh, question, which I'm sure a lot of people are, are, are wondering, Zen, and, and that's if, uh, if you're taking new patients at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> of course, yeah, of course. Yeah. So unless, unless Jazz, do you have another question that you'd like to ask before we start wrapping up here? Um, yeah, Zen, and it'd be great to know, um, will there be another viewing of this of the office, the dental show before it closes or before December 11th, maybe? I don't know, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we could. Uh, I mean, certain... yeah, well, I mean, we haven't, you know, to tell you the truth, you know, so one main difference with this exhibition and all the exhibitions we used to do is that the previous exhibitions were always in the backspace, so it didn't interfere with uh, with the business at hand. Correct. As well, there was not COVID. And so we did have two weekends where we opened, or one weekend, two weekends. Two weekends. Two weekends where we had it open to the public. Uh, but the rest of the time, you know, we, uh, it's by appointment to the dentist. So it's really, it's really an exhibition. You can call it elitist or practical. It's up to, you know, each and every one to decide, but it was really like about, you know, it's like, you know, it's a little bit for the, for the people who go there, right. To kind of, you know, but uh, I'm sure if you make an appointment uh, with the dentist, they might, um, you know, you can call the dentist, talk to the secretary and they might find uh, a time when you can come and visit. Right. But uh, that's not up to me. <laughs> it's up to Zen and staff, I think. Yeah. Sorry, Tracy, if you're there. <laughs> that's my receptionist. <laughs> but that's true. Patrick's, Patrick's, yeah, that's very true, though. It, it, right now, I mean, the 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 work is is uh, on the walls in in the operatories where I actually patients are being seen, as well as in the waiting room. So uh, it's, I suppose we should be open. Maybe we should have another weekend if, if we could, but more easily available to the public. But it, it is kind of the, the building is closed. It has to be, you have to get buzzed in because of COVID, et cetera, et cetera. It's still happening. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for that conversation today. Um, thank you all for all the great questions as well from the audience. Uh, it was really, it was really inspiring to see ever so much engagement. I do have a few housekeeping notes um, just before we, just before we wrap up here today. So if I just pull up my notes here. Um, so we, in November, Griffin will be hosting a few more um, virtual programs. So we'll have live from the studio virtual events with our two current artists and residents. Uh, Molly Burke will be joining us on November seventh at one p.m. And Tan Tan Hong will share what she's been up to in the studio on November 21st, also at 1 p.m. Uh, so if you'd like more information about those events and registration, you can visit our website. Uh, and similarly, if you haven't yet had the opportunity to check out the current exhibition um, featuring this great collection, um, it will be open until December 11th. Um, so if you would like to register for that, you can also do so on our website. Um, so thanks again, Zenin and Patrick, for joining us today. And um, of course, for Jazz as well, for helping me moderate this discussion. And I hope everybody has a great Sunday. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you, Zanon. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks, Zanon. <laughs> Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.